my goal tonight is to kind of tell you a little bit about myself, um, how I, I came up with the, the restaurant business. Um, I hope that I can inspire you guys in some way that being called a dreamer is actually a gift that people don't understand. So, you, so hopefully I get that. Um, so my story starts with my childhood hero. Who knows what their childhood hero was? Anybody? Anyone? No? Well, what was yours? My father. Oh, that's awesome. Oh, mine's so not good. Not, not good like that. <laughs> I'm so done. But mine did wear a cape. So I guess that's good, right? He was like a superhero, right? So, um, my first hero was a man called Evil Knievel, right? <laughs> this guy was the man, right? People would, they would sit in front of the TVs in the 70s to see if he was going to live or die. And I, I remember um, sitting, sitting there going, oh my God, that is so awesome. And this guy was, he would jumped these buses on, that thing was about 400 pounds. So it was not, and he didn't have a lot of skill. And the guy ended up like this most of the time. And this is my hero. This is what I had to, to go with, right? So it, it kind of brought me into the next phase of my life. Oh, I wanted to tell you a little bit about all that. That's later on. That's a, this, he broke more, almost every single bone in his body. He broke his femur seven times. The, I mean, that bone is massive, and to know that you broke it seven times is, is unreal. And again, most of the jumps he did, he was going out in an ambulance. So my parents were stoked. But it, it really, <laughs> this changed my life right here. That motorcycle. I remember the first time I got on, and I always get emotional when this happens because it's so, I, I can, it takes me right back. Um, the first time I got on that thing, I knew I was hooked, that there was just nothing that was going to stay. I remember that first day I got on, I was so small, I couldn't even touch the ground. And I was riding it back and forth, back and forth. and. I ended up doing the Evil Knievel, Evil Knievel wheelie stand. So I was on the seat doing the wheelie, and I totally ate it. And I remember pushing the motorcycle back up to my parents, and I was so afraid. I was crying, and I was scraped up all over, and I was crying. The, the thing that I was crying about, not that I was scraped up, but I was afraid my parents weren't going to let me ride again. I was. That first time, I was done. I was in it. So I, uh, I remember <clears throat> in third grade, I had, had um, not done very well in, in school. And I remember um, telling my parents um, that it doesn't matter. I'm going to be a professional motorcycle racer. It doesn't matter. I am going to be like Evil Knievel, and I'm going to be this big star. Well, my dad looked at me and goes, you're going to break your neck on that motorcycle. You don't want to do that. But I, I knew that that's what I wanted. Every time I put on that helmet, it was, uh, how do I say, um, it was like calming to me. And I just knew that that's what I wanted to do. So I was going to be a big motor star. I was going to be spraying champagne, kissing trophy girls. And my dad's like, how are you going to make money at that, right? Um, so I remember telling teachers that I was going to be a motorcycle star. They're like, you got to be realistic. How could you possibly be a motorcycle star? And I did. I had a lot of challenges. How was I going to be a motorcycle star when my parents didn't want anything to do with it? They had no, they didn't want to go on a Sunday and watch me go around a dirt track. 
And besides, you're, you're going to break your neck on that thing. So I remember um, at a early on, I, I learned my entrepreneur spirit is I had to take action early on. I had to figure out how I was going to get to the races. Um, and that's because my, my parents weren't going to take me. So I remember pushing my motorcycle to the gas station to have my friends pick me up. I learned a lot about being resourceful. I had to, I mean, I had to find people to sign the waiver, the liability waiver. So I would go to these races, and I didn't even know if I could race. I'd have to find somebody, will you be my daddy tonight? <laughs> so, so, and if they knew my dad was an attorney, they probably never would have signed it. Um, so it also taught me a lot about discipline. I had to, at an early age, I had to work on my motorcycle. While my friends are out having a good time, I'm working on my motorcycle because my parents aren't. I'm going to bed on a Saturday night while all my friends are having a great time. They're going to the prom or all of those fun things. Um, but it, it's funny because I, I look at my first business and I found this in my dad's closet the other day. He wasn't super supportive, but he was supportive enough to give me a jacket. <laughs> and his name's not anywhere on it. <laughs> so um, this was really my first, I guess I would say, business, because I felt like I was on my own. Um, so I, uh, I was lucky. I actually grabbed a few sponsors, and I started racing. I got skipped ahead there. So um, that's when I was like 13, and I was on fire. That was before my, my shoulder surgeries. So the awesome thing was I turned pro at 15. So I made it to the pro level. You think that's awesome. He made it. Yeah, I made $20 my first pro race. Didn't even pay for my uh, entry fee. So I, uh, it, it wasn't always that easy. So I ended up, the good thing is my parents really instilled in me that I had to finish high school. No matter what I did, I had to finish high school. And um, it was probably one of the best things that happened to me. By this time, I had already had two shoulder surgeries, pins in my hand, um, broken my collarbone, and I'm 15, 16 years old. So, um, I, and at this time, I wasn't really making enough money for the doctor bills. Thank God my parents, they didn't support me much, but the, the, the uh, insurance was great. So I'm at a Supercross race in a, a big stadium race in Seattle. And I'm still paying for all my stuff. I get approached by somebody from South America to come down to South America and um, race for a team down there. I'm like, I'm in. I knew there was money down there to be had, so I funded my own ticket. I get off the plane, and the team is done. So it wasn't, there was no team. But I wasn't going to give up. I used my resources. I went out and sold myself. And I finally got on a team. And I, I luckily, um, so for the first time in my life, my dream is coming true. I am focusing on my craft, the, the thing that I'd always wanted to do. I, it says, North Americans dominate. Yes. So, I mean, I was in newspapers. I was on TV. I was, um, I, I thought I was pretty cool, right? You, you think you're pretty cool. I'm spraying champagne. I'm kissing trophy girls, right? This is what it's about. And, um, sorry, honey. <laughs> uh, this is my, my friends. I would have them throw out um, stickers, and I would just douse the, the crowd with champagne. My kids love when I spray champagne on them. <laughs> we had our own Learjet. So I'm 23, living this awesome dream, right? I, I think, wow, this, this just can't go on, this, this will never end. But all the trophy girls and all of that stuff was nothing. I, I thought the highlight of my career was when I was walking down the street in Rio, 
and I had brought my dad over um, to come see me race. He hadn't seen me race a lot. I brought him over, and people, when I was walking down the streets of Rio, were asking for my autograph. And it was so cool in front of your dad, and he's like, wow, I'm glad he didn't break his neck. <laughs> <laughs> so you're living this, this thing, right? I'm, I'm 23 years old, and I have this, I feel like I'm accomplished. Um, I end up flying my mom out to a, a race. Um, she had seen me race three or four times. I, never good every time she showed up. I was always on the ground. And I'm leading this race. It's the biggest race of the year. It's in a huge stadium. Um, I hit a dark, dark patch in the, the track. It was at night. And it flipped me over the motorcycle. And the motorcycle landed on top of my head with the, you could understand this, the wheel was spinning wide open on my head right next to it. And I was, my shoulder had popped out through the back side of my arm. And I am, I'm in South America, right? So how, <clears throat> how I'm having these guys pull my shoulder, it took five of them, and it, when you're in another country and you can't speak the language, think about how scary that is. For, for me and my mom, she was freaked, right? I'm in a different country. <clears throat> and so I knew that that was it. I, I had to get surgery in South America. It was, it was a great hospital. I mean, they were, they were super awesome. But um, I knew that... Things had to change in my life. I had seen way too many doctors. I had skirted. I hadn't broken my neck, so that was a good thing. So what am I going to do for the next chapter of my life? Like, how am I going to, what am I going to do? You always look at these things. You're 23 years old, and I was, all my, all my friends had already graduated college. But I came back, and I said, you know what? I'm going to go to college. And I knew that my brother had graduated from Cal Lutheran. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to go apply to Cal Lutheran. I mean, they're a private school. They're going to let me in, right? I'm totally good. I had a GPA of about a zero in high school. <laughs> there, there, there was absolutely no way they were going to let me in. So I got denied. But what it did teach me was that I had to go to junior college. Was it a bad thing? No, it was an awesome thing. Because it taught me all of the things that I learned. Um, I remember going to junior college and being the older guy, right? All my friends had graduated. And there, there was nobody asking for my autograph down that hallway. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was empty, that old guy, get away. But what I, what I did learn is I learned from the bottom up. I took beginning math. I took beginning math. I took beginning reading and English. I dove in so hard that I used those, the discipline that I learned from the racing, the resourcefulness. I was living with tutors. I mean, I, I would go in and I would use the tutors constantly. And I was, um, I just built the fundamentals. And I just kept going. And I ended up getting A's. And I, I, I mean, it, it was hard work for me because I was not geared for that. Um, I ended up, thankfully, I, I got into Cal Lutheran finally and had a great experience. And I, I was going to go into physical therapy and I, took the summer off and I was working in physical therapy and I read this book, Think and Grow Rich by Napoleon Hill. This changed my whole demeanor of what I really wanted to do. I knew I wanted to create. I knew I wanted to have a business, something that I fully controlled and I could immerse myself in. So I, I came across this. I was driving by this place in Thousand Oaks. It was a franchise. It was a a juice bar. And I see the line out the door, and I'm like, oh my god, the restaurant's like full. I'm like, I gotta get a piece of that. 
So I go in, and it's a franchise. I, I was stunned. I'm like, this is a franchise? I, I, gotta, I gotta get some of this. I took, I took the, um, the material home, and like some people do, they just set it on the table. I called, and I created a plan from that. They gave me some of the numbers of their stuff. I, um, I remember telling my friends, I think I'm gonna open a juice bar. Like, you don't even like smoothies. I go, I, I don't. <laughs> but it, it, didn't, it didn't matter, right? For me, it was about building something that I could do and control on my own. I'm sure everybody has that feeling, right? So again, I, I went into the motorcycle mode, right? I, I had to take action. So my action was plan. You gotta, you gotta have that plan, right? So for me, it was like 300 smoothies a day, or 300, 300 smoothies a day. And I, I calculated it all out. I got a loan, I borrowed money from my brother, I borrowed money from my dad, I, um, took equity on my house from, from the money I had. And luckily, uh, that first year we opened and it was good. That first year, again, I went back to the whole thing you'll probably hear over and over with me. I learned the f fundamentals, not of just making smoothies and you know stirring up the strawberries and everything. I learned how to really run a business. And I learned about real estate. I, I learned about where to pick real estate. I learned, um, I, I mean, everything I, I got out of that, that core piece of business is what I got that, those first years. So um, I'm living the dream, right? I, I, we get up to three units, and I have a mobile trailer, and I'm thinking, there just wasn't something in my gut that I just, I didn't have. I didn't think that this could propel me to the places I really wanted to go. So I ended up selling the juice bars to a company called Robex, which is, I mean, they're, they're pretty much everywhere. So um, done. I am take a vacation to Thailand. But what I really did, like most entrepreneurs, you travel around and you're looking for ideas. Um, and I figured, so what's next? I should maybe just open a, a restaurant. You know, I, I figured I threw, I mean, I, I had, um, I, I wanted to do something that I fully controlled and owned. So I wanted to be able to touch the walls. I wanted to be able to, design the culture of the restaurant. I wanted to do it all from scratch and not a franchise. So I, I remember traveling uh, with my wife now. We traveled around. We went to um, New York, Ohio, looking at restaurants that I, I wanted to do. And, and then it, it just hit me. Why not a sandwich, right? I mean, it's been around since 1820. <laughs> Let's do a sandwich restaurant. So I remember, I mean, what I really, I mean, I wanted something that was not in the marketplace. I wanted something that was restaurant quality food, but fast. A community cafe where people gathered for lunch and dinner. A, a place where they made the bread and, from scratch right there in the fired oven. And so like most things, right, it's, it's logical. You tell your family, I'm going to go into the restaurant business now. God, you're crazy. You're the pickiest eater we know. <laughs> but it didn't matter. So I remember telling my, my father-in-law the first time I met him, after I had sold the juice bars, I said, I said um, my wife introduced us. And he said, yeah, he's going to open a restaurant. And her dad looked at me and Loco gringo. He has no idea how hard it is to run a restaurant. And it is hard. I mean, when you, when you really think about it, 90% fail within the, the first two years. Um, landlords don't want to rent to a mom and pop like me. How am I going to get a, a location, right? 
um, how, is it, how are you going to get a loan um, from a bank without being a franchise or a corporation? Um, uh, but in my mind, I could feel it. I knew that it was something that would work in our community. So I found my dream location in Ventura. I just kept thinking about it. I got to have this location. I got to have this location. I got to have this. So I literally begged those landlords. I was calling constantly. Please, please, please give me a shot. I know. And, and to them, it's just an idea. A lot of people have an idea. But really doing it is fearful for, for landlords. So um, we finally broke, I broke them down. The landlords caved. We started building the first Urbane Cafe. It was urban then. Um, of course, I was hanging speaker wire, cables, painting, everything that I could possibly do to make this dream happen. So finally, we had a fully built restaurant, all centered around a hearth baked oven. But we had, had no menu. <laughs> and, and we didn't have a bread recipe. But I got really fortunate that I met a, a, a guy named Pete Ransom, a, a mentor. And he taught me about back of the house operations. He helped me come up with a, he came up with a bread recipe. We sat down and we created a menu. I mean, this is the first sandwiches that went out. I literally stuffed my wife full of sandwiches for <laughs> she was, I think she was burned out by the time she left. Um, but we, and again, I, I did the same thing I always do. I had a, um, I had a, a plan. And, and that first year when we opened, after we opened, um, the goal was, again, I was about 300 sandwiches. Um, and we hit that right out of the gate. It was a, a very good run. Um, but I took everything those first years of the cafe, I, I was disciplined. I got in early every day. I either prepped, I worked the line. I was all over that place figuring out how could you make this to scale? How could you, um, how could you structure this to make more? And I sat, I would get up at five in the morning or whatever and create training manuals. And um, so I was the same thing. I was just disciplined, learning the fundamentals of that business and trying to grow it. Um, the goal, again, was, 30, was 300 a day, and we hit that. Today, we're over 700 a day. So um, we've been around a while, but so just to kind of tell you, like, we, now we're up to 11 locations. It's been a lot of fun. Um, but the, the thing I always, I always look at is... Um, why the restaurant business? What, what makes me excited? What do I love about it? I, I love people coming in and enjoying their food. I love, I love seeing their face when they're looking down at the sandwich and they go, oh, what is this? And that gets me stoked. Um, <laughs> I, I love building a team. Like we have Emily back there, super awesome. The, the general manager of Thousand Oaks. Thank you, Emily. She's awesome. Um, that's super fun. But you know, last week I was at one of our restaurants and I got this call. It was right at lunchtime. I was, I was at one of our other restaurants. And the, the manager said, hey, there's a water sprinkler that just burst in, in Valencia. You need to get out here right away. My first thing is, is everybody OK? It's like, yeah, everybody's OK, but it's totally flooded. We're going to have to shut it down for the rest of the day. But you need to get out here because the fire department's here. And I remember going up to a, a, 
one of our, our guests that was at the Ventura location, and I went up and I said, hey, how's everything going? And she goes, not good, my mom just passed away. Her friend looks at her and goes, all she wanted to do was come to the cafe today because it made her feel like home. And that is why I love the restaurant business, right? Every day we get, whether it's a lunch with a son or um, a business lunch or a, a lunch with a daughter, every day we have this amazing opportunity to create memories within our restaurant. And that's what I love about the restaurant industry. And I remember thinking how thankful I was that that restaurant was closed that night because I was able to take our team out and create a memory over that. And that's what I really love. So I, I missed a couple. And, and when we talk about memories, this was the last time I got to have lunch with my dad. And thank God it was at my restaurant. <laughs> so kind of wrapping this up, there's, I always remember being so bummed out at my parents for not supporting my, my motorcycle racing. I thought, all these other kids, their parents are just helping them and buying them motorcycles and going to the races. Man, I just envied them. And I look back now, and my parents did the greatest gift for me, making me work for it and earn it. And to that, I really owe them everything. So I always ask this question, and I, I probably drive my wife nuts with this. You know, is it luck or is it more? And I always think, I've been super lucky my, my whole life. I mean, I'm, I didn't break my neck, right? <laughs> um, but there's a co common thread that I've used throughout my life it, is that it's okay to be a dreamer and dream big. It, it cannot hurt. Because if, if you dream here, oops, if you dream here, you're going to make this. Set your dreams higher. You, you, you're always going to make this. Set them high. Achieve. Um, you got to be passionate about what you do. You got to love it. And if you don't, find something else. There's, I mean, there's a ton of stuff going on out there. Just, you got to build, whatever you do, build that strong foundation to be the, the best student. You, you got you to build that foundation to be the best business. You got to build that foundation and learn it from the ground up. You got to be around the right people. The people that want you to succeed. There are so many that don't. Prove them wrong. Because you can. This, this other one I love is, I think is important, is you got to give. You, you got to give to great organizations. It's really important. It seems the more you give, the more you're going to get. So be generous. And it's not, and, and this, I'm not perfect. It's not about the money that's giving. It's the time. How do you, for me, sometimes it's, I give money and not enough time. And, and, but it's really about the time and not the money. Um, but all of that doesn't matter if people do not take action with what they want to do. You have to take action today. You have to take action tomorrow. And you have to build a habit of taking action. Because people get complacent. So you got to push yourself. And you got to have that fire in your belly. Tack! <laughs> um, so we have this saying in our house. My kids know this, that up and down. If you believe it, you can achieve it. Right? People will say, oh, that's hokey, hokey dokey. But I, I truly believe that for a guy, the, red, the, the sandwich has been around since 1820. You put a spin on it, 
and you can create this amazing dream. I can buy my kids Legos, which is super awesome, right? <laughs> um, but you can. So, <clears throat> um, so I'm going to leave you with this. You know, life, life is a journey, and mine has been. It's been exciting and fun and tormenting at the same time. But just live with passion and purpose, and you will always have a good life. So thank you.